Do you ever wake up from a dream, a really good dream, and are filled with an overwhelming desire to go back to sleep and continue to dream a little bit longer? Maybe instead, a pleasant feeling dream energizes you, motivating you to get up and begin your day. Perhaps one's life circumstances affect how we respond to dreams. Lately, I've had similar thoughts about memories. Sometimes remembering a good memory leaves me feeling inspired and energized, but other times, a good memory prompts a desire to go back in time to that idealized period concocted in my brain's archives. One of the reasons I love video games is that, in a way, they allow me to go back in time. Not literally, of course, but by replaying games associated with certain memories and periods of my life, I'm able to sort of relive those memories in a more tangible way. It's like opening up a time capsule. I've always been really thankful to be able to relive some of my most precious memories this way, but sadly, there are quite a few experiences I can't go back to and experience the same way I did all those years ago. And these games are often ones I've spent an enormous amount of time in. I can not only look back on them and remember fond experiences, but also examine how I've changed over the course of my time playing them. It's for this reason that I spend a lot of my time thinking about games like this. And lately, I haven't been able to get one in particular out of my head that, for the rest of time, will be little more than just a good memory. A game I can't replay no matter how much I want to. At least, not the same way it became what is likely my single most played game of all time. This is a story about my favorite game that no longer exists. I don't really get MMORPGs. Despite my distaste and lack of understanding of most MMOs, I've got to admit they're one of the most fascinating video game genres to think about because their development and maintenance is an immense undertaking. MMORPGs are massive in scale, spend loads of money every year on server costs and technical support, and are constantly releasing content updates at a faster rate than other games in order to retain their players. To put it simply, MMORPGs require exorbitant levels of funding just to get off the ground, and their design encourages players to commit to just a single game at a time, explaining why so few of them release in the current landscape. As for those that do, only a global superpower like Amazon that burns unspeakable amounts of cash to drive out competitors and gain market share in a new industry would develop and release an MMORPG as their foray into video game development in 2021. To a player like myself, one that has repeatedly tried and failed to understand this genre, all of these modern MMOs feel stuck in established norms, yet intimidating and uninviting. They all look the same, feel the same, and are fueled by the expectation that once you reach max level, once you reach the end game after grinding through less satisfactory content for countless hours, the real game begins. Even when a brand new game like New World comes along, trying to shake up the formula, I don't even want to bother trying because I've tried enough modern MMOs to understand that minor changes aren't enough to get me truly invested. This design philosophy has never resonated with me, especially after trying to hop on board a boat I was horrendously late for. But rather than blame my dissatisfaction on poor timing, I've come to the conclusion that I repeatedly failed to connect with this type of game because my idealized version of an MMORPG is antithetical to what the modern MMO has become. The game I fell in love with released way before common practices were established and was the exact opposite of what every WoW killer strived to be. That game was Korean developer Wizet's hit 2003 MMO release, MapleStory. MapleStory is one of the longest running games in MMORPG history and a pioneer to the free-to-play model of monetization. But if you told me you'd never heard of it, I'd believe you. Despite remaining immensely popular worldwide, particularly in Korea and China, on top of reporting substantial growth in Western regions during recent years, MapleStory is rarely talked about in the West compared to its counterparts commanding significantly more mainstream attention. Its original release preceded 2004's World of Warcraft by about a year and a half, but it didn't reach North America until 2005. I first got my hands on it a year later, when I was 10 years old. 
Having just moved to a different state, I found myself a brand new group of friends after dealing with the first few terrifying weeks of entering a new school. And they all played MapleStory. Looking back at that time, I can see exactly why MapleStory made such a strong first impression on me despite simultaneously feeling so foreign. At its most basic level, it was everything I imagined WoW wasn't. The chibi, cartoonish art style was so colorful and vibrant. The characters and iconic monster designs were so expressive, charming, and seriously still haven't aged a day. Having grown up with a game library dominated by console platformers and flash games, the primarily keyboard-controlled 2D platforming and simple action combat with spammable abilities resonated more with me than tab targeting and complex cooldown management ever could have. But perhaps its most important aspect, the key detail that made MapleStory so immediately addictive was the ability to come home from school and get right back to chatting and playing with friends online at absolutely no cost. Even if a 10 year old whiz begged his parents to purchase a subscription to World of Warcraft, there was no chance I'd be able to play. I'd already tried with RuneScape in years prior. This newly established free to play model was undoubtedly pivotal to MapleStory's success, at least in regions outside of Asia, because everything from its art style and design to its low system requirements and gameplay loop targeted a fairly specific age demographic that didn't have any money to support its development. Until the day they aged into paying customers, what they did have was nothing but free time to build strong bonds with a game that, in hindsight, masked its insanely grindy, time-consuming, and horrifically balanced gameplay experience with a host of brilliantly designed social features that kept players like me coming back day after day, month after month, even year after year. In the beginning, MapleStory was a pretty simple game. The original Korean launch featured three main classes with their own specializations, Warrior, Archer, and Mage, with a fourth Thief class soon to follow. The game didn't launch in North America until Thieves were already added, and the fifth Pirate class didn't release until several years later. This period is what many long since forgotten players would refer to as something of a golden age for MapleStory. Leveling up primarily by fighting endlessly respawning hordes of monsters was the name of the game, along with completing simple quests in group dungeons called party quests to break up the monotony. The average player was anywhere between level 10 and 70, with levels capping out at an insurmountable level 200, an accomplishment believed to be only attainable by a certain subset of MapleStory's most dedicated players the pros. While a years-long race to the top was raging amongst the highest percentile of players, for the rest of us, the goal was often just to explore the world, reach the next job advancement to obtain new and more flashy skills, and prove to our friends that we were better than them by outputting marginally higher damage values. From the onset, I found the core gameplay loop of MapleStory to be incredibly fun and addictive when experienced with friends, but one problem proved to be constant. Continuous progression was an incredibly grindy and time-consuming experience. Out of the three main methods of gaining experience to level up, the first could be unreliable at best. The second, while fairly fun in its own right, most often provided so little tangible value it wasn't a great use of time. And the third, despite being a clear favorite, could leave players waiting around for upwards of a few hours just waiting for their turn to partake with no guarantee it would actually arrive. The first was naturally killing hordes of monsters. Monsters could be found just about anywhere, but the best areas were extremely conducive to training due to their platform layouts and increased spawn rates. These maps were widely popular because mobs could be grouped to decrease their overall time to kill and mobility-based characters could be constantly zipping from one corner of the map to the other in a combat-induced flow state. It was a fairly satisfying gameplay loop, the only problem being that the best spots were susceptible to overpopulation and the experience Experience bonuses gained from grouping up with other players were so negligible that it often made more sense to train on your own. Each server hosted a maximum of 20 instance channels that players could switch between at will to avoid overpopulation. But some spots were so disproportionately better than others that every spot on every channel could be filled at peak hours. 
While some players stumbling upon crowded channels took the cue to search for an open spot elsewhere, others forced their way in, much to the ire of more powerful and competitive players, which at best led to a little kill stealing and at worst led to all out wars, where intruders were outright stalked by other more powerful players, preventing them from gaining any experience at all. It was remarkably competitive. For players struggling to find adequate training spots or were simply bored of the grind, quests could be completed in conjunction with training, particularly in unpopular areas that were the sole source of quest mobs. This brought some value to these maps that were most often neglected in favor of the more densely packed ones conducive to grinding, and some quests were fun little distractions from the core gameplay loop, while others even forced players to escape their comfort zones by traveling to different continents for purposes as simple as delivering an item from one NPC to another. I enjoyed questing if only for the fact that it forced me to explore the maple world, as some of my fondest memories playing the game encompass long treks with friends, with no goal other than to see what we could find, often treading carefully through maps home to the most powerful monsters in the game that could easily kill us with a single touch. The rewards for completing quests, however, were about as volatile as exploring these high-level areas, sometimes providing powerful enhancement scrolls that were always in high demand, while other times providing pitiful sums of mesos and items disproportionate to the amount of effort it took to get them. The one constant was that questing on its own could never be the sole path to progression, as quest availability was limited and the experience reward was little more than mediocre. Party quests were undoubtedly my favorite aspect of the entire game, forcing players to group and work together while questing and grinding could largely be completed solo. There were always masses of players vying to complete PQs because they combined the best aspects of the former options for leveling, typically consisting of a sequence of stages housing monsters that yielded increased experience, along with minor cooperative puzzles capped off by a challenging boss. The rewards were good, the experience was even better, and best of all, they were always the most fun way to play the game. Without early exposure to group content like this, I probably would have quit the game entirely before reaching so much as level 30. So in that case, why even bother questing or grinding solo in the first place? Like most things in MapleStory, there was certainly a catch to participating in PQs. For one, only certain level brackets could participate in certain PQs. That much made sense. But more importantly, each PQ could only allow one party to participate in each server's instance channel at a time, making the act of merely participating in a PQ more competitive than duking it out for training spots ever was. Because there was such a high demand to participate in an arbitrarily limited supply of PQs, a meta surfaced involving the use of certain strategies just to gain access. Certainly one of the most bizarre traits of MapleStory's culture. By utilizing a chat command that allowed a player to track others' locations simply by typing in their name, players could receive a heads up on when the incumbent party would be exiting the dungeon. Once a party entered the bonus stage that followed the final boss, the privilege to enter next was up for grabs following a short cooldown that barely allowed the original party to return for a chance to re-enter. Instances of multiple parties fighting for their chance to enter were common as party leaders with a faster click often edged out their competition. And this only scratches the surface of bizarre strategies used to ensure repeated entry to PQs. Any player advertising a track received immediate priority in finding a party, regardless of their ability to actively contribute within the dungeon. In the event that someone had to leave the current group, it was common courtesy to prematurely leave the dungeon to find a replacement in order to not sabotage the party. Some players sneakily tracked players on their buddy lists or added others that were commonly participating in PQs to their blacklists to be tracked later, and some even went as far as actively sabotaging their current party to re-enter with a group of friends by forcing the entire group out of the dungeon with a single click. This is my guilty admission of participating in all three. I can't imagine another game ever engineering a system like this for group content without being endlessly criticized for it. But for MapleStory players, this was normal, and to be honest, I actually miss it. 
Not because you ran the risk of being sabotaged by supposed friends and cutthroat players, or because the rewards were so much better than training that it made more sense to wait around not playing the game just for an unguaranteed chance of admission, but because this mind-boggling system, along with its many oddities, established bonds and severed ties between players unlike any other game I've ever played. Players in competition established reputations in the community and rivalries with others. But more importantly, waiting around for a chance at completing PQs is what led me to establishing a network of online friends I relied on for years. That was the funny thing about MapleStory. I can't think of another game that more easily encouraged players to make friends both purposefully and accidentally. Not long after my introduction to the game, many of my friends from school who hopped on board around the same time struggled to keep up and began dropping like flies. At a point, only a handful of us remained and we were often doing our own thing in game. So I ended up spending much of my time alone. However, I loved talking to just about anyone I could in game. Players often gathered in towns just to take a break from the endless grind by mingling with others. I remember whenever I wanted to take a break, I would go to this offshoot map of the most populated town in the game, Hanesis. It was called Maya's House, and there I would strike up conversations with other players who were there for presumably the same reason as me. The anonymity provided by the game gave me the confidence to approach new people when I didn't have the self-esteem to do it in my real life. And the conversations felt weirdly intimate because the characters were so much more expressive than they were in other games. Perhaps more similarly to other games, typing in all chat posted a speech bubble above the characters' heads that invited others to join the conversation. But unlike those other games, I always felt more inclined to chat in MapleStory because the funny looking character emotes often brought down the awkward walls of starting a conversation. They made other players feel more friendly and approachable. After making some friends this way, we chatted in the buddy chat channel, which was more or less an open forum for broadcasting what you were saying to your entire friends list. I regularly saw friends chatting with others I didn't know, and after chiming in, I was invited to get to know their friends as I introduced them to my own. For better or worse, if I was getting to know somebody new, chances are an entire network was formed with no other link than a desire to have others to talk to. I met quite a few people this way, but my longest standing friendships began when I found myself in a PQ party with another player I had repeatedly used as a track. We jokingly bonded over this, and after a few runs together, decided to make chatting and playing together a daily habit. We would explore the world together, showing each other our favorite areas, participate in PQs, and even just sit around to talk and enjoy each other's company along with other friends we made along the way. She was a near constant in my life for at least half a decade. There were quite a few times where I decided to take a break from the game, when life was pulling me in different directions, and I would log out without any warning or goodbyes. But even when I believed there was no going back to MapleStory, for the longest time, something always managed to draw me back in. I strangely made it a habit to check the leaderboards to see if my friends were still playing, even when I wasn't, and any time a new character class or rework coerced me into logging back in, perhaps predictably, the first thing I would do, regardless of whether I was logging into an old character or creating a new one, was type the same slash find command. Sometimes she couldn't be found, but miraculously, most of the time, she was still playing on the same character always a substantially higher level than the last time I logged in. I think after a while, if she received a whisper from another player whose name she didn't immediately recognize, she started just assuming it was me. I don't think there's another person I spent more time playing MapleStory with. After all, in a way, she sort of watched me grow up from age 12 to 18. But for some reason, whenever I think deeply about MapleStory, memories not of her, but another begin to surface. Someone she introduced me to so many years ago. While our relationship didn't last as long, there was this connection we shared that was supremely special and went deeper than just the game. Instead of being able to remember her character's name, I can only remember her real name. I do remember she played a male character because she didn't like the attention and harassment most girls received from others at that time. And for no other reason than blind trust, she entrusted me with some of her most powerful gear. When I got it stolen out of my own naivety, she didn't care. Our friendship was more important.
In MapleStory, on the outskirts of a town of toy blocks called Ludibrium, is the Helios Tower. There's a portal inside Helios Tower that transports the player to another instance of time. In the Ellen Forest, younger versions of some of MapleStory's iconic characters can be found, like the Bowman Instructor, Athena Pierce, and the Warrior Instructor dances with Balrog as a baby. Ellen Forest is a pretty secluded area that not a lot of players regularly visit, even when it was first released. The music track that plays in this area is one of my favorite musical pieces in all of video games, because every time I hear it, I'm flooded back with some of my favorite memories from all my years playing MapleStory. Tina loved the music of Ellen Forest perhaps more than even I did, so for hours, we would sit in one of the corners of its many secluded maps just to talk about life outside of the game and where we wanted to be when we grew up, both venting many of our frustrations. Free of any judgment, I was able to express my truest self during middle and high school, arguably one of the most difficult times to figure out what kind of person you truly are. I take much solace in the fact that she gave me a safe outlet to be myself in a time when I often felt alienated from other people at school, even some of my friends. And for a while, we continued to keep in touch after we both stopped playing the game. It's been years since we last spoke. I had her phone number saved in an old Motorola flip phone with a goofy ass retractable antenna that's long since been lost, likely severing our connection forever. It's been a long time since then. I don't have a desperate desire to reconnect because I'm happy with the relationships I have now, but I guess if there was one thing I wanted, it would be to just know that she's doing okay. If our relationship forever remains just a good memory, I think I'm okay with that. There's something you should know. The majority of recordings I've chosen to accompany the story thus far feature gameplay clips that no longer represent what MapleStory eventually became. What I've shown you are decade-old clips, thankfully preserved by just a handful of MapleStory's dedicated players. In 2021, this is MapleStory. It may not immediately look too different aside from some UI changes, but I can assure you that logging back into MapleStory after several years of inactivity struck me with a sense of whiplash I didn't think was possible. On December 7th, 2010, a new patch that promised to completely change MapleStory from its core was released, fittingly titled The Big Bang Update. While MapleStory had been receiving a steady stream of content and quality of life updates up to this point, the Big Bang update was introduced presumably to usher the game into the next decade, rewriting the entirety of its code in the process. The UI was changed, stat formulas for everything you could think of were completely rewritten, most of the maps were redesigned from the ground up, and classes were reworked. Glorious 720p resolution was finally available. But perhaps the most significant change of all was a global reduction in the amount of experience needed to level up, a change that is still hotly contested by long-standing members of the community. In retrospect, I believe a modernization update like this needed to happen eventually as Big Bang was undoubtedly instrumental in extending the game's life well into the next decade. But at the same time, a dangerous precedent had been set that would lead to some irreversible damages needed to be addressed later with emergency updates. The most significant of those damages was that the game was about to become overwhelmingly pay to win. To be clear, MapleStory was always pay to win to a degree. As soon as I was old enough to purchase prepaid Nexon cash cards, I indulged in some cosmetics, convenience items, and gachapon tickets to farm some rare and expensive items. But up until this point, indulging in microtransactions never felt required to compete with most other players. The update that single-handedly ruined the game for me was the release of item potential and miracle cubes, introducing an unforeseen level of power creep the developers have since been forced to address to keep MapleStory from dying in recent years. While all equipped items previously had fixed stat bonuses that could be enhanced with scrolls, item potential introduced percentage stat bonuses on top that dramatically increased the player's power the higher their natural stat pool became. The problem was that a piece of equipment's initially revealed potential was typically complete garbage, but its power level could be re-rolled by miracle cubes, which could only be purchased with microtransactions. 
Suddenly, players began spending hundreds of dollars perfecting item sets as their power levels shot through the roof compared to other free-to-play only players who could barely keep up with gathering gear relevant to their level. As if it were a cruel reminder of our modern economic reality, the inequality gap between players began to widen exponentially. I can't believe I'm saying this, but it was like Maple Story late stage capitalism, complete with a never before seen influx of content updates to keep players spending. In the first four years of the game's release in North America, only three new class updates were released, and one of those simply added a group of variations to the original five with just a handful of new skills. After Big Bang introduced an entire faction with three brand new classes, even more classes with new lore dumps, better mobility, and flashier, more powerful skills were being added to the game about every six months. And they all had new gear types that the most competitive players would proceed to spend hundreds of dollars on cubing to perfection. In spite of the game's direction moving further and further away from the game I fell in love with, I continued to return after long breaks to experience these updates. For a while, there were still enough players populating most areas and running through low-level PQs for me to have a similar enough experience as before. And the reduced leveling curve allowed me to try out classes I was always interested in but never got around to in fear of the grind ahead. And yet, every time I reached a high enough level where the real game began, where I could begin bossing and work towards reaching the level cap, I lost interest, beginning a new character to do it all over again when basic gear stopped being viable. I stopped playing because I refused to be a slave to Nexon's monetization strategy, a strategy MapleStory's most dedicated players had succumbed to. The last time I regularly played MapleStory was in 2013, shortly after the Luminous class was released. This story arc had been building up for years in which five heroes who had sealed away the primary antagonist, the Black Mage, needed to be reawakened to fight once again after the seal had been broken. Aaron, the warrior, Evan, the mage, Mercedes, the archer, Phantom, the thief, the only hero missing was the pirate, a class I had been anticipating for years as all the pirate classes had been severely underpowered and underutilized since their release. However, instead of the fifth hero being a pirate, it was another mage? I no longer cared for what this game had become. The developers clearly didn't have any plans for the story outside of using it as an excuse to introduce more content to keep their paying player base engaged. And who can blame them? All I knew was that despite growing up with this game, despite the best memories and friends I had made before and after the Big Bang, this wasn't Maple Story anymore. At least, not the Maple Story I loved. That pirate class did eventually release, retconning the original five hero storyline with the inclusion of a sixth forgotten hero. And I have yet to play it. Logging back into MapleStory in the current year was quite frankly like watching a George Lucas remake of the original Star Wars. It sure looks familiar. The timeless art style of the original characters, maps, and monsters has been maintained all while being updated for modern displays. And all the quintessential locations remain fairly intact. You can still visit Victoria Island, Orbis, Ludibrium, New Leaf City, and Leafray just like you could in the good old days. But something feels off. The once simple UI is kind of a mess with strange windows and icons all over the place, and when you try to engage with any of it, you're just bombarded with information. If you try to make a new character, the classic and straightforward explorers classes that allowed players to craft their own stories for the characters are buried beneath pages of new classes that aren't so much character archetypes as much as they are original characters with their own stories that end up bogging down the experience with pages upon pages of poorly adapted dialogue. All of the maps that were once filled to the brim with players at peak hours look like ghost towns that were once again completely redesigned at some point between Big Bang and now. And the players that do remain just sit there AFK like robots, kitted out with cosmetic items purchased with microtransactions that make themselves look like K-pop idols. Nobody is publicly chatting like they used to, and characters like mine that resemble what MapleStory used to look like stick out like sore thumbs. I made a new character, a thief, to get an idea of what the gameplay experience was actually like nowadays, and after one hour of play, I had reached level 30 an achievement that normally would have taken anywhere between a few weeks, sometimes months prior to Big Bang, and at the very least a few days following it. 
During that hour, all I did was complete a series of nearly identical quests in which I was tasked with killing a certain amount of this monster, followed by killing a certain amount of this stronger variation of said monster that's actually just the exact same with a different name. I didn't even get to explore the world because more often than not, accepting a quest automatically teleported my character to the exact map the objective was found in, even across continents in enough cases. It was mind-numbingly boring. There were no other players to be found, there were no PQs to participate in, and the only solo content to look forward to were theme dungeons that had been completely redesigned with the rest of the game to add more story and dialogue that feels like it was barely scraped together by company interns. And what I can only believe was an effort to double down on retaining the existing player base at the risk of alienating new and casual players, every aspect of the game was redesigned for the sake of convenience. To a degree, it makes sense. Anyone still playing MapleStory 15 years after its release is probably tired of having to grind through early game content when they make a new character. But to me, this pursuit of convenience just feels like an attempt to funnel free-to-play users into becoming paying players as fast as possible due to this sunk cost fallacy approach. The higher the level you reach in MapleStory, the more uneven the balance of power between players can potentially become, thus further encouraging players to try to even the playing field through the purchase of microtransactions. Maybe I just don't get it. The same way I don't understand the appeal of other MMORPGs, but the fact remains that a large part of the MapleStory community eroded away with these changes, and at this point, I'm not sure there's an easy solution to bring them back. For many years, I did believe that there was not only a solution to this eroding player base problem, it was also staring everyone in the face. In 2013, the developers of longtime MMORPG phenomenon RuneScape announced a poll for the creation of an old school version of their game, in which a 2007 version of the game would be available as an alternative for players unsatisfied with the current version. Much like MapleStory, RuneScape went through similar modernization updates, leaving it in a similarly unrecognizable state, and player numbers began to dwindle as a result. Longtime players came out in droves to voice their support and interest in old school RuneScape, and it wasn't long before active player numbers for OSRS eclipsed its modernized counterpart following its release. Not only did OSRS offer players a classic alternative to RuneScape 3, it reshaped the trajectory of RuneScape by updating the game in better accordance with its players' interests by only introducing content and quality of life updates voted in favor of by the community, with years of hindsight to go off of. The success of OSRS proved that many MMORPG players still enjoyed a slower paced, more grindy experience. Over this industry-wide, homogenized approach designed to throw as much content at the player as fast as possible. And for years, I, alongside countless other alienated players, wished for MapleStory to receive the same treatment. I believed that releasing an alternative version, much like old school RuneScape, would give everyone what they wanted. The current players could continue to play on whichever version of their choosing, while long since forgotten players would finally have their voices heard, complete with a slower rollout of community voted content updates and balance changes. However, unlike RuneScape, with MapleStory, it's not quite that simple, and the community is a little more divided on the idea of introducing a classic alternative that could fracture the existing player base. The most common argument, and subsequently one with the strongest ground, is that Old Maple Story is a game rife with horrifically balanced design choices that really began to rear its head the further one progressed. Some of these poor choices were obvious from the start, like how warrior and pirate classes were insanely underpowered in the most common level brackets compared to their counterparts. But upon closer examination, a lot of the higher level content including PQs and boss raids were nearly impossible to clear for even the strongest of players due to the insane likelihood of being wiped in a single hit. And this could only be overcome by utilizing an exploit known as HP washing. Try to stay with me on this one. By first allocating ability points into HP instead of the four basic stats of strength, dexterity, intelligence, and luck, players would eventually reach a level of bonus HP that would allow them to more easily survive boss encounters at the cost of dealing little to no damage. That is, 
until reaching a high enough level and HP pool to then purchase AP reset scrolls with microtransactions, allowed players to reallocate those HP points into the required stats for increasing damage without negating the bonuses gained to HP, seemingly due to an exploit. To make matters even worse, players who intended to participate in bossing couldn't train their characters up to the required level to begin using AP reset scrolls on their own because they did no damage, thus requiring them to purchase a leeching service from other players, power leveling while they most often just sat there clinging to a rope, not actually playing the game. Admittedly, it's a system I still don't fully understand now and back then didn't even know existed alongside most other players. But now that the game has been figured out, a classic server would without a doubt eventually suffer the same fate unless stat and experience formulas were completely rewritten along with boss encounters being redesigned from the ground up. The other potential and perhaps less obvious problem is that old MapleStory was a lot harder to monetize without all the pay to win microtransactions that plagued the experience for free to play players. Easing up on or outright eliminating pay to win microtransactions makes more sense for subscription based games like RuneScape and World of Warcraft compared to MapleStory, a game that relies on its whales for financial growth. The fact of the matter is, MapleStory does not have a large enough base of players paying subscription fees to rely on like these other games to justify taking the same risk. And with Nexon reporting year over year financial growth for the current version of MapleStory, who can even blame them for not wanting to take a chance on players like me that could easily walk away after realizing the actual quality of the product did not match expectations born of nostalgia. It's so little of a priority for them that any talk involving this very subject is outright banned from being discussed on MapleStory's official forums. That's not to say the current developers of MapleStory have taken no action addressing the monetization issues with the current version of the game. They've actually done a decent job by introducing a unique server that negates any pay to win advantage while providing an almost RuneScape Iron Man experience by barring players from trading in favor of encouraging them to find their own gear in the world. It was definitely a step in the right direction as population density in that server continues to prove, but it still exists on the current version of the game that fails to scratch the itch former players like myself have been seeking. You know, when I decided I wanted to cover MapleStory on this channel, a game I've spent almost a quarter of my life playing, I wanted to sing its praises. I wanted to show what a monumental phenomenon it was in countless people's lives just like my own. But more importantly, I wanted to show how modern MMORPGs alongside MapleStory itself could learn a thing or two from what was already achieved in the past. However, I think I'm coming away from this project with a bit of a different conclusion, at least regarding the game itself. Truly, MapleStory as I once knew it was a product of its time, when the target audience weren't whales that financially kept the game afloat, but just kids with nothing but free time on our hands, occasionally dipping our fingers into our parents' wallets. We were okay with grinding the same maps for hours. We were okay with waiting exorbitant amounts of time just for the chance to participate in group content. And we were okay with simply exploring the maple world with our friends because it was such a novel concept at the time when accessible online gaming was in its infancy. What I think I've come to realize is that the market demographic for MMORPGs has grown up. They have jobs and families to take care of. They don't have the time to spend plucking away at menial tasks or waiting for boat rides like they once did. I've seen old MapleStory referred to as a glorified chat client, and to a degree, I believe that's correct, because it predated chat clients like Skype and Discord. These have become integral means of communicating online which explains why MapleStory players don't publicly chat in the game like they once did. Everyone is already using Discord. Instead of focusing my ire on design choices made by the developer, I think my problem with this modern version of MapleStory is a player problem. These companies that have developed MMORPGs for years aren't stupid, at least some of them. They adapt to what the market wants, and I think what I want doesn't really align with what the majority of MMO players want. I think that may say something about me I've been afraid to admit for a while, but hopefully I'm not the only one out there that feels this way. 
At the time of this recording, I'm a soon-to-be 26-year-old still trying to make sense of the world in such a turbulent time to try to just live, torn between wanting to live out my passions or settling with something less satisfying but more financially secure. I think about MapleStory and other games like it, not necessarily because I want to play again, but because recalling those memories gives me a sense of comfort when I'm surrounded by unknowns. I can recall those memories of sitting in the Ellen Forest with my friend happy and safe, but much like how the world around me changes year after year, actually returning to the Ellen Forest failed to provide a fraction of the relief it once did. The maps were once again completely redesigned, and I can't seem to find that spot we used to sit in. My friend is gone, but certainly not forgotten. This is the risk you run by attaching oneself to a live service game, one that changes dramatically year after year to keep up with the demands of the market. They're not trying to leave you behind, just moving on the same way everyone else must eventually do. But rather than mope about it, I think taking a minute to not only remember but also reflect on a video game that once was but never will remain an important aspect of my life gives me a little more strength to move forward. I'll never forget my time spent playing MapleStory. As much as it was just another way to kill time with a bunch of my friends and little responsibilities, there wasn't much else I would rather have spent my time on. As long as it remains just a good memory, I think that's enough. And instead of going back to sleep to dream a little bit longer, maybe it's time to get up.